All right, welcome everybody. So our speaker today is Theodora Borney from Tennessee, a University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And she will talk about ancient solutions to the mean curvature flow. Please go ahead. Well, I wanna thank all of you who are organizing this and for inviting me, giving me the opportunity to give this talk. And I apologize because maybe some of you have uh, heard this talk before. Um, so this, this is a work we've been doing with Matt and Giuseppe for some time, and uh, we've been excited to finish it. So I keep like giving the uh, talk on this subject. So, um, right, I'll do a little bit of a um, introduction. Oh, let me see. If I, I got have an issue. Okay, yeah, there we go. So what is mean curvature flow? We'd say that a family of hypersurfaces moves by mean curvature flow if um, the speed is equal to the mean curvature vector that is given by uh, the mean curvature times the normal. So the um, way the convention we use is we use the outward pointing unit normal. H is positive um, for a sphere. So therefore, when uh, here we want things like um, mean convex things to contract. Okay, now very simple um, shape here shows evolution of a curve under the curve shortening flow, which is the mean curvature flow in dimension one. So of course, like the more the curve curves, the faster the speed is, and it moves always towards this convex. Part. Okay, so this is a, a picture of the different time slices. So we see we start by a curve, the curve starts um, going inwards here, and it becomes more and more round, and it eventually will disappear to a point. Now in higher dimensions, things are more complicated because we have multiple curvatures. So, and, so for example, like I mentioned too, the mean curvature is the sum of the two principal curvatures. In general, the sum of uh, n curvatures. And standard examples are that of a sphere. If you have a sphere on the mean curvature flow, it will remain a sphere and it will start uh, shrinking down, eventually disappearing to a point. You can write down by the symmetry this equation here, the mean curvature flow becomes um, just an ODE on the radius, and you can work this out and get what is uh, the radius. Another example is the shrinking cylinder. Again, the cylinder will remain a cylinder, and as time evolves, it will start becoming a smaller and smaller radius, eventually disappearing to a line. Okay, so. Mean curvature flow has uh, many applications. It's um, been used to describe various physical phenomena. So for example, it occurs in the evolution of interfaces, which arise in multi-phase physical models. It's also been used in material science to model things like cell, grain and bubble growth. And it also finds applications in image processing, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, right, now we are more interested in uh, geometric applications of curvature flows. And some examples are the following. So we can use curvature flows to, um, to prove certain classification here. And this happens because under curvature flows, we have certain inequalities that are preserved. So for example, convexity or two convexity these are uh, geometric properties that are preserved under mean curvature flow. So we start flowing something that is convex. If we can say what happens at the end when the, um, or as the flow evolves, then we can somehow classify convex surfaces. So such theorems we have by Huskin, Huskin in Australia and Brendan Huskin, where they worked on this uh, convex and two convex surfaces. Now, another uh, application is we can prove geometric inequalities. And this is done by using 
certain monotone quantities. So if you have a quantity that you know is monotone under the flow, so you start by a surface, you end at another surface. If you know that the um, inequality is true here, you can say that it's true at the beginning. So things like this have been used to prove isoperimetric inequalities and Alexander pension inequalities. And there's also a very nice um, application of curvature flows to prove the Riemannian Penrose inequality. Uh, and this is done by the use of inverse mean curvature flow, which is not, uh, we flow not by the mean curvature, by one over the mean curvature, okay? And this is like a result of Huskin and Ilman um, using this monotonicity of the uh, Hawking mass under inverse mean curvature flow, they were able, able to prove the Riemannian penetration flow. Now, third um, thing one can do is produce stationary solutions. So stationary solutions for mean curvature flow are exactly minimal surfaces. And what we do here is at certain cases, you can show that the flow exists for all time. And when this is the case, what happens at the limit as t goes to infinity, you get a minimal surface. So you can use this um, flow to create minimal surface. And there are other things you can do by changing the flow. You can um, you can create the equivalent minimal surface. Okay, so let's go back to mean curvature flow. The problem with mean curvature flow is that the right hand side, that is the mean curvature, might yeah. go to. Infinity. I'm sorry. Um, so the mean curvature might go to, to infinity in finite time. In that case, we say that a singularity occurs. So we've seen the case of a cylinder and a sphere. Okay, of course, like the sphere when it disappears, the mean curvature goes to infinity, but that is not a very interesting singularity because everything has disappeared. Now, a little bit more complicated is this example of the tumble, where when you have this, what we call a neck pinch, the curvature goes to infinity, but you still have surfaces going on. Um, you still have part of the surface that is that is there. And in fact, mean curvature flow satisfies what is called the avoidance principle, which says that if you have two things that are disjoint at the beginning, they will stay disjoint. So if you have a compact surface, you can put it inside a ball, and you know that the ball is going to disappear in finite time. Therefore, in finite time, something should happen to your surface. So every complex surface will create a singularity. Okay, so we're interested in studying the singularities. Um, knowing what a singularity looks like is very important. For example, when I was mentioned like um, the Huskin sinistrati um, work, they actually use what we call mean curvature flow with surgery. So when things, when there are parts of your surface where the curvature goes to infinity, what they did is cut off these parts and created a new smooth surface and continue the flow. But to be able to cut out these parts, you should know very well how the singularities look like. And that, that is why we have, that, well, that is a reason why we have interest in studying the singularities. So how do we do this? We perform a parabolic rescaling about a sequence of space points that approach the singularity. When we do this, when we, we blow up around these space-time points, what we obtain is a mean curvature flow that has a property that existed for all time in the past. Such a solution, we call it ancient solution. Okay? So this is similar in minimal surfaces. When you have a singularity, you blow up, what you get is a tangent cone. So the equivalent thing here is an ancient solution. Okay. And in fact, um, one more comment is that you can do this rescaling in a certain way so that the solution of mean curvature flow that you obtain moves under a one parameter family of, of uh, symmetry. And this is either translation or dilation. 
In this case, your solution is in fact characterized by an elliptic equation rather than a uh, parabolic equation because all the time slices can be determined by a certain one. Okay, so we want to know how the singularities look like. We have, um, uh, so, so we have this very difficult question to classify all possible engine solutions. Of course, like in that generality, this is, um, this is not possible to do. So what we uh, can do is impose certain geometric conditions. So we start imposing geometric conditions and want to classify ancient solutions at least under that. And the one um, condition we're gonna impose is convexity. It turns out that the singularities of any mean convex solution is um, convex. And um, therefore, like assuming that we're looking at convex ancient solutions does not restrict, um, does not, it's not a huge restriction. Now often, but not all the times, we're gonna assume compactness. And when we do this, we will assume that the final time is equal to zero. So when we're looking at compact ancient solutions, you, you can shift time and assume that they disappear at time uh, zero. And also, I mean, I didn't, I, sh I should have said this. I should have added a comment on this. Yeah, I haven't. So it is known by a theorem of Huskin that if you start by a compact convex solution, then this will um, start shrinking and will disappear to a round point in finite time. Right, now, um, as I said, often we can perform this rescaling in a way that we get uh, very structured solutions. And these are called soliton solutions. The ones that I mentioned, they move um, either by dilations, this we call shrinkers, or by translations that we call translators. So the shrinkers, they satisfy this here. So the time slice at time t is a dilation of the time slice at time minus one. And the translator is a, translate, is a translation of um, uh, time slice at time zero. So the important thing is that here, you can forget about the parabolic equation and just look at the elliptic equation, okay? So, so the mean curvature of a specific time slice satisfies this equation for a shrinker, satisfies this for a translator. And these equations are very similar to the prescribed mean curvature equation. Right, so let's look at some examples of ancient solutions. We have the Grim Reaper, that's um, a solution of curve shortening flow. This guy here is um, a solution, the Grim Reaper that moves to the right with speed one. This guy is given by the graph of the function x, goes to minus log cos x and moves by speed one. Okay, so that's why we have this t here to have a different time slice. This is a solution that lies between two parallel lines whose um, distance is pi. Okay, now an example now of a compact solution is the angular oval. The angular oval looks like, is again like a solution that lies between two parallel lines of width pi. And as we go to minus infinity, these tips here, they look like the Grim Reapers. And um, in the middle, you just see two parallel lines. This um, has a very nice expression that's given by this guy here. Um, okay, so the cosine of x equals e to the t hyperbolic cosine of y. Now, if we look at this equation and we change the hyperbolic cosine to a hyperbolic, to hyperbolic sign, what we get is a hair clip solution. This guy now is a non-compact, non-convex example. And it looks like a bunch of green reapers coming from above, a bunch of green reapers coming from below. This is also an eternal solution. So it not just lives for all time in the past, but also for all time in the future. 
And this is an example also that as you take the limit as t goes to plus infinity, you just see a straight line, which is uh, a minimal surface. Well, for um, what I meant, so you can get like as, as a limit as t goes to plus infinity, you can get minimal surfaces here in dimension one, they're just lines. Okay, so what can we say about um, classifying things in dimension one? In fact, uh, the compact case was already known. Hamilton Scalabulo Sessum proved that the only compact convex embedded ancient solutions are the shrinking circle and the angular oval. Now that I see embedded, I remember uh, that I should have also mentioned here, everything we talk about is embedded. We, we, um, should have added this is a condition. We don't deal with immersed things. Okay, so um, more recently with Matt and Giuseppe, we um, removed the compactness hypothesis. So we showed that if you add the Grim Reaper and the stationary line, then these are the only convex embedded solution. And in fact, there is like a difference in the proofs that Hamilton and Scalopolo says in proof uses more PD, they use like this Lyapunov functional that is monotone under the flow. And they actually, they use how the flow looks at minus infinity or plus infinity. And they were able to show that the only solutions are the angular oval and the shrinking circle. And it helps that you know the angular oval as I showed before comes in a closed formula. Um, okay, now um, in our case, we use well, um, a lot, a result of Shuza Wang that um, is referred to as Shuza Wang's dichotomy that I'm gonna explain um, in a bit and Hushkin's gonna raise for me. Now, what does this dichotomy say? It says that there are two types of compact convex ancient solutions. There are the ovaloids, the ones that sweep all of space and the pancakes, the ones that are confined between two parallels. Now, um, here's an example, the yellow one is an example of a rotation symmetric overload. Um, so here you should think of as you go to minus infinity, this, um, the time slices that fill up the whole space. Whereas here to the right, this is an example of a rotation symmetric pancake. And like here, as time goes to minus infinity, you fill out everything in a slab. Okay, so um, for the existence of the rotation symmetric overload, this was um, described first by Brian White, then Hasselhofer Herskovich gave a um, better, no, 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 uh, they gave like a more detailed construction and Angel and Laskalopoulos says even later, they gave precise description of the asymptotics and how this, this guy looks like. Now for the pancakes, Zhu Wang in the same paper, he had um, shown that these guys exist. And then we uh, gave a more uh, detailed construction um, and asymptotics of this rotation symmetric pancake. Right, now what if we um, try to classify these guys? So of course, like when um, in the ovaloids, one can consider the sphere as well, but we're gonna separate this. When, when I say ovaloid, I'll mean something that is not the sphere. Um, for the sphere, it was known by Hushkin and Sinestrari that if you have something that's compact and convex plus some kind of geometric condition, then you get the sphere. Now I leave it very vague here because there's like many different conditions that they came up with but they all uh, go under the umbrella of what we say type one, okay? So this is the way that the curvature goes to zero as time goes to minus infinity, okay? And then uh, Hasselhofer Herskovich and Matt, they gave like more different conditions. And very recently, Stephen Lynch, he was able to remove the compactness hypothesis. Uh, right, now what is happening with the overloids, angular scalopolis and cesium, uh, they show that there is a unique, closed, non-collapsed and uniformly two convex overloid. 
um, that is not the sphere. Now, non-collapse, you can just think of overloads and uniformly too convex is something say in two dimensions, which is the easiest case to picture, it is a vacuous condition. Okay, so you can think in two dimensions that the only overload is the rotational symmetric one in the sphere. Um, yeah. Now for the um, for the pancake, in our paper we also show that um, there is a unique rotational symmetric one. So we used. Um, we had to write precise asymptotics for this pancake and say that this is a unique one. So the question is what happens with further example? Okay, now we know there are no more overloads, but are there more uh, pancakes? And before um, I uh, go into this further examples, because we're gonna use this a lot, let me just write, um, describe this pancake a little bit more. So here, Again, like we draw everything dimension two, of course, like in the rotation symmetric uh, uh, component, you can put more dimensions, but let's just stick with two. So this guy here to be described, you wanna describe how this point P looks like, how this point Q looks like. So P is a point that approaches the plane. Q is a guy that goes to infinity. So um, when you look at the tips here, as you go off to minus infinity and you wanna see how they look like, okay, you take your point QT, you bring it to the origin and you let T go to minus infinity, what you will see is a um, green plane. Okay, so this is for the shape of your solution around the tip and the points, they move uh, as we write here. So the important thing is that here the curvature is almost like exponentially small with, with time. And this guy here, Q moves with speed uh, one plus one over T. Okay. So the distance, this point moves like T plus log T. Okay. And so if you, uh, Remember the equation for the angular over, the angular over moves with speed one. So this guy here looks like a rotated angular over. So you pick up a one over T because of the rotation. So this is the extra speed. Okay, so, um, right. So this is a, the picture that helped us think of how to create more ancient solutions. So if you look at the angle and over, the angle and over looks like two Grim Reapers coming together. The ball there, sorry, the rotational symmetric overload looks like two balls coming together. And the rotational symmetric pancake looks like a bunch of Grim Reapers in a circle, again, coming together. Um, now the, um, the advantage that the pancakes or like things that are collapsed have is that this picture is exactly what is happening. So you do have two green rivers coming together or uh, green planes coming together. Here in the overloads, this is a little bit misleading. You have to actually scale to get these balls. It's not, you cannot, the mean curvature here at the tips will be going to zero, but under rescaling, you can uh, make sure that you create this ball soliton. Okay, this ball soliton, I didn't say it, but this is looks like a paraboloid and, and it, it is a translator in dimension two. Okay, so uh, what do we have? Uh, now let's look at a translating solution. Okay, because um, if you believe that you can construct the um, ancient solutions by putting together translators, then you better know what translators uh, look like. Okay, so there is uh, the green plane, as we said. So uh, the green reaper cross R. And this is here the equation of a translator. I'm gonna think that they translate um, on the vertical direction. Then you can take your green plane, 
you rotate it and you scale it. And if you do this appropriately, then you get uh, what we call an oblique green plane, okay? So this is still a surface that is cross, something cross R, but it's, it's, um, it's tilted, okay? So, so you make new dot EM plus one smaller. That's why you have to scale to, to what happened? Uh, did it become small for you too? Yes, you scaled. It's, you scaled. Uh, you beat me too. How did I do it? Oh, there you go. Okay. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Uh, right, now there are these other examples that come by putting now uh, two oblique green planes together. Okay, and um, again, like this, where first um, known by Xu Wang in, in his paper, and then Sprack and Shao, they had um, a construction. We had one, and um, Ilman and Hoffman, Martin White, they also had a construction. And furthermore, they showed that this, if, you, if we add this, then we're done with the translate. These are the only uh, convex translators, okay? So these guys here, Depending on uh, the, the green planes that you put together, you have, uh, you look at where, um, you have different widths of, of uh, your domain, okay? And for each slab of width alpha pi, there exists a unique. Uh, now, if, if you put strictly convex and this guy is not, uh, is ruled out, so you only get one uh, wing solution. Uh, Theodora, there's a question, Stephen, yeah. if you... Oh. Yeah, if I could, this very lovely talk, Theodora. So quick question on these oblique grim planes and the wing solutions. Are the natural symmetries of the mean curvature flow which allow you to uh, connect these solutions? Uh, so if you take, for example, the oblique grim plane, is there, isn't there a natural symmetry that allows you to identify that by action on the non-oblique plane? Um. You mean like, yeah, you rotate? Yeah. Well, this, you know, the fact that you can rotate, it's, it's also only though, because this guy uh, is something cross R. You, you wouldn't be able to do this with anything else. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, I just, I just wondered if you sort of parameterize the relationship between these by associated symmetries of the, uh, of the yeah, curvature but, flow. Yeah, yeah, but I, I think, I think, I, Kind of understand what you mean. The, the the symmetries of the equation that give you the uh, shrinkers and translators exist. Okay, so so the so the um, equation is uh, has certain uh, invariances like scaling, and these invariances they give you certain solutions like self shrinking or translating. Okay. Yeah, I was now, thinking more of an anisotropic. I was thinking more of an anisotropic scaling to get this uh, oblique grim plane. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure how to answer that, but uh, is yeah, okay. It's just 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 a thought. I wonder if you if you thought about that. So this, this, I mean, to me, like it's it, it makes sense that it exists just because when you have something cross R, you can tilt and scale. Okay, but this is just for the translators. Uh, like like this this equation here, if you tilt and scale, then you know it's still like uh, it makes sense. But as long as you have cross R. Uh, okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, okay, let's. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, right. So we have this translating solutions which are example of eternal solutions. Eternal solutions um, are solutions that live for all time in the past and for all time in the future. So they have to be non-compact. So the question was, can translators, uh, sorry, can, would all eternal solutions uh, be translators? And this was um, a question of Brian, a conjecture of Brian White, where he, um, Said, and if you if you assume convexity, then eternal solution is translated. 
So part of our um, constructions were to find something that uh, violates this. Okay, and I'm gonna describe that too. So, okay, how are we gonna construct these new examples is by taking this, um, well, that was the original idea. Okay, take this ring solution and glue them together. And like, it seems that you can, um, by this picture, you create something like a triangle, but gluing together different ones, maybe you can create different polygons. So before I, I describe what, um, how we constructed this, I will need a couple of definitions. So the first is, um, well, actually this is the, the, the center of one. The squash down of a solution is defined by the following. So I'm gonna let omega t be the convex region that is enclosed by mt. So I take omega t divided by minus t. And we take the limit as t goes to minus infinity. This gives me a convex body here, omega star, uh, which we'll call the squash down of the solution. So for example, if we look at the, green, the angular oval, these tips here, they move with speed one. So the horizontal displacement at time minus t is, sorry, time t is almost like minus t. So when you divide this by minus t, you get one. And at the limit, you're just gonna get minus one, one, the close interval. You see that the, the, any, the slab line is gonna be uh, squashed, okay? So what you get now is omega star is a convex region, one dimension lower, you lost the slab. For the pancake, uh, the rotation symmetric one, we know that the edge here moves like minus t plus, and this is in the uh, dimension two, this is just gonna be one. So minus t plus log t, when you divide by minus t, you just get one and this, this goes to zero. Okay. So what you get in this case is uh, the unit sphere. Okay, so this will be the squash down. And we also gonna be using the support function. The support function, uh, remember, is um, just the distance of the tangent plane at a point with normal c. So I look at the point that has normal c. I look at its tangent plane, and the sigma gives me the distance of this tangent plane to the origin. It turns out that under mean curvature of flow, the support function moves by the mean curvature. So everything now it is, um, is convex, so we can parameterize by the Gauss map. Uh, right, and the, um, the speed of the support moves with the same speed, with speed equal to the mean curvature. Now, Hamilton's Harnack inequality, which is also another tool that we use a lot, says that for an ancient solution, the mean curvature is monotone in time. Okay. And this also works for the Gauss parameterization. So these two equations imply that the support function is locally concave with respect to time. Okay, now using this, we get that the limit of the mean curvature as t goes to minus infinity exists. So as for a specific z, I can write this function h star, which is the limit as t goes to minus infinity. And I can write the function sigma star, which is equal to sigma over minus t. And in fact, the two are the same. because This is not difficult to see by the equations above. So the two are the same and they are defined as squash now. So the fact that these two exist, you get that omega star is defined before exists. And sigma star is the support function of this omega star. All right. Now, our first uh, observation is the following. When I talk about an asymptotic translator at a point C, remember C notes the normal, 
means that I'm gonna take a time slice t, gonna take the point that has normal equal to z and take this point to the origin and keep doing it for a um, sequence of times going to minus infinity. Now, because of the Hamilton's Harnack inequality, the mean curvature being monotone, it's not difficult to show that in fact, you have a limit and the, the limit has, is, is a mean curvature flow whose mean curvature is constant in time, therefore a translator. Okay? And we call this an asymptotic translator at C. This is what you see at minus infinity around the point C. Okay, now this guy moves with speed equal to H star, because this is the limit of the mean curvature as T goes to minus infinity, which is equal to sigma star. Now, any translator in a slab of width pi must have mean curvature at least, must have speed at least one. And this comes uh, because else you can use the green plane itself as a barrier. Okay, so we know that the, the squash down omega star has support function, which is at least one at every point. Therefore, the unit sphere is inside omega star. Okay. All right, so then um, now let's focus at any solution that is in a pi slab. And the questions we wanted to answer were first, what omega star can occur as a squash down? And for what omega star, we can actually construct the solution with this squash star. So for example, here, um, the, for the rotation symmetric pancake, omega star uh, is a unit disk. So the unit disk is an example that can occur. And in fact, there's a solution that gives you this as a squash star. The wing solutions here, if you, if you look what omega star is, this is a, a non-compact example. So you should think of this guy moves with speed t, then you scale down by t, what you get is a, is a circumscribed cone. Okay, so what we were able to say for the first example, um, for sorry, for the first question is the following. So there exists a convex ancient pancake in a slab with pi with squash down omega star equal to p for each of the following p. Now all the p's are circumscribed and uh, we can create a solution where p is any regular polytope bounded uh, or unbounded. So again, in dimension two here, think of a regular polygon. Uh, but you know, and then um, th this is the whatever the construction works for any dimension. Okay, and uh, when we say regular, like in general, this means that the symmetry group acts transitively on its flag. Okay, a flag would be like the 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 whole sequence where you start by uh, the biggest dimensional phase, you go to the smallest, smallest, and so on. Okay. And the second shape we can do is P being a simplex, bounded or unbounded. Okay, an unbounded simplex would be a cone whose link is a simplex. Okay. So simplex, um, when you see in a second, well, a couple of seconds, um, the importance of being a simplex is that it has the minimum number of uh, edges or facets in, in high dimensions. And finally, this, which looks like a little bit um, weird, you think like, why would we want to do that? You can also do any truncated regular cone. Because if you have here your cone and you cut off an edge, this is the non-compact uh, polygon, we can create these guys as well. Now this we did because we observed that they actually give you eternal non-translating solutions. Um, and that's why they, they are important here because they show that this conjecture 
um, was false. And a couple more comments is that all the solutions we constructed are reflection symmetric with respect to the uh, mid plane. And moreover, the asymptotic translators, they have the expected Gauss map, Gauss image. So what do I mean is that when you look at the asymptotic translators of certain polygons, that, let's say, you get the correct wing. So for example, I, I showed this picture before with the three wings coming together. If you create something on a triangle at the edges, you're gonna see um, the, the wing translator. Uh, so let me just like write the rough idea of the construction. So let's take uh, a circum circumscribed polygon, anything right now, no conditions. And here to the left, you see a non-compact one and to the right, a compact one. Okay, and I'm, uh, yeah, by V, we're gonna denote any vertex and ZF would be a normal to a to an edge or a facet in higher dimensions. Okay, so what we do is we have like this polygon, we'll scale it by R so that the, instead of the unit circle, I have a circle of radius R circumscribed. And on each edge or facet, what we're gonna do is attach green planes. This creates a convex body, which of course is not uh, smooth because of where the two different green planes meet, but it is convex. Okay, and it is known that once you have convex things, you can flow them and they will immediately become smooth. So we create the solution for each R and we let R go to infinity hoping to obtain an ancient solution. And um, I don't have time to go into too much detail, but let me say there are two um, main ingredients that we use. First, when you start with this configuration, you can uh, observe that the mean curvature of your configuration is always bigger or equal than normal dot V V is any vertex. This tells you uh, that your solution is a super solution of the translator equation. And, um, right, okay. So also you can um, use for, from the inside as an inner barrier, you can use the rotation symmetric pancake. Now this, you cannot just use it as an inner barrier to, well, you can just use this as an inner barrier to make sure that the time that things like uh, get extinct, they are big enough. But more importantly, you can use it and play around in the interior to get um, curvature estimates. So it turns out that the pancake is almost a sub-solution of the translator equation. Your solution here is a super solution of translator equation and you can move it around and uh, use PDE to obtain curvature estimates for your solution. This is a very, I mean, um, it's pretty technical, so I'm gonna skip it here. Uh, okay. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay, now for the second question, which said we wanted to look in general, what kind of convex um, bodies occur as squash downs. The one um, thing is that every squash down circumscribes the unit disk. So something like this here is inadmissible. Okay, so everything has to circumscribe uh, the unit disk. Moreover, when we're looking at eternal solutions, so uh, the final time is plus infinity, we can define what we call the forward squash down. So this is defined in similarly as the backward, but now we let time go to plus infinity. And it turns out that the two have um, 
they're very well connected. So here in the picture, you can see that if omega lower star is a backward squash star, then uh, the forward squash star is what you get by removing, by sorry, by moving everything on the other side of the circle or the sphere, creating a cone, which we call the forward squash star, okay? Um, so it's defined like this, but I think with the picture makes more sense more evident what it is. Okay, and now having this relation, we can um, say the following. So a, a solution will be a translator if and only if the two squash terms, the forward and the backward are the same. And also if and only if the backward squash term is a cone, okay? So if it's not a cone, you see here from the picture, there's no way that the two will be the same. Uh, okay, moreover, we have a description of a green plane, then the solution will be a green plane if and only if the backwards question is a half space. And moreover, we were able to use um, reflection principle to show that at least for two dimension solution, everything is reflection symmetric. Uh, right. Uh, okay, and again, just like uh, very quickly, the idea of proving that here, let's look at this picture here, uh, that you have to have something that is circumscribed is because if it was not, you will be able to put a pancake inside and violate the avoidance principle. In this kind of a configuration, you can do the same, but but the analysis is a little bit more uh, complicated. Okay, and well, yeah. And here to show that, I guess I should mention that to show that things are reflection symmetric, to be able to say this, we use the fact that we know what the asymptotic translators are. So as long as they are um, green planes on the, on the correct points, then we can show that things are reflection symmetric. Okay, let me um, end with some further questions. So the most, well, to me at least like interesting open question now left from all this analysis is how to construct a solution for any circumscribed polytope. Now the problem, say if you look at a, um, so imagine a quadrilateral that has um, that is circumscribed. When we try to do this business of putting like the green planes and taking a limit, we had an issue uh, with the following. What could happen is that you lose one edge and you get a triangle. Okay, so so there is a triangle that contains this quadrilateral, and you might lose a face and get a triangle. So uh, yeah, so this was a little issue we couldn't resolve, how to make sure you don't lose edges. And that's why when you have something that is, has enough symmetries, this cannot happen. Or when it has a minimum number of edges, this cannot happen. Um, another thing is the uniqueness of solution. So even in the case where the squash done is S1, we don't know if the rotation symmetric pancake is the only one. So we know that it is unique if you impose rotation symmetry, but could there be something else that is not rotation symmetric whose squash down is S1? For different omega stars, then we don't, we don't know even under certain symmetries. So with the polygons, if you, if you impose some dihedral symmetry, could you say that this is a unique? Um, this is probably, I would say probably no, but we don't have a good reason why uh, things probably no. Um, well, for, for uh, especially with the dihedral symmetry, okay, for S1, it's, it's even more subtle. Um, okay, then again, like for the asymptotic translators, when we 
in the examples that we actually constructed, then we know what the asymptotic translators are. But in general, we would like to say that once you have, you know, in your polygon, once you have this specific angle, then you get that specific uh, uh, translator. Okay, this is not known. Or like um, in general, like could do, could we get uniqueness? Uh, and in fact, we believe that you get a green plane if and only if you're looking at a point at a facet and a, and a normal that corresponds to a facet or an edge. But I mean, in general, we don't know. Maybe some has like green planes that are forming you know, steeper and steeper creating this corner. Uh, okay, so now um, if, if this is resolved, then hopefully we can say something using an iteration, we can say something more on translators. Um, so we would like to say, okay, now we know how translators look in dimension two, but what about dimension three? You should be able to say, okay, because I know now the dimension two ones, I know the asymptotics of the translators dimension three, so therefore maybe I can I classify the translator. And finally, yeah, I would believe that everything should be reflection symmetric and uh, it they should be able to this to be proven in dimension bigger than three as well. Okay, and I guess I should stop here. All right, thank you very much.